The Videlcon 4900 type test sets come in several different models. The model we have chosen for this training class is the 4904A cable fault locator. This is a tone type test set and the theories and principles we will be talking about later will apply to most tone instruments. So that we might become familiar with this test set, let's take a look at the basic pieces that make up the package. I'm going to move this contact frame back out of the way so we can see the instrument a little better. If we open this up, I've opened the transmitter and I'm going to be taking out the receiver. Now, all of the things that we're ready to haul out will be talked about in greater detail later. All the cords, the handheld wand are all stored in the lid of the test set. This is the 25 foot transmitter cord. This is the three section collapsible wand which we can put together very easily. We have a six foot coil cord which is to connect the wand to the receiver. The instrument also comes with a standard ground rod, although any normal grounding connection will do. Let's get in close now and look at the front of the transmitter panel to discuss the operating knobs. Starting on the right hand side, you'll notice that the transmitter cord has been plugged into the transmitter outlet. Directly above this, we have the receiver storage compartment. Below, we have the lid for the battery compartment, which we'll come back to later. Moving over to the left, the main knob on the front of this panel is the signal loading switch, which has several functions. First of all, moving the signal loading switch to the battery test position permits us to check the level of batteries in the instrument. Watch the needle on the meter. If it moves over to the right hand side in the battery OK check area, your batteries are ready to go. Moving the signal loading switch to the ohms position, we can now measure the resistance of faults with the ohm meter from 0 to 1000 ohms. In case it's a high resistance fault, we can go to the times 1000 scale, again looking at the ohm meter from 0 to 1 million ohms. The ohms reverse switch is to detect the presence of foreign battery. Now taking the signal loading switch one step further, we can now put signal out on the faulted cable. You'll notice you have an output blinking light, which tells us that there is in fact signal going down the faulted cable. We can adjust that level of signal higher and higher depending upon the resistance of the fault. On setting one, we also have the ability to lower the signal level to zero. This is extremely important on high resistance faults, which we will cover in another lesson. The other two knobs that you'll see here in front that I haven't talked about are the ohms zeroing knob, which is no different than the zeroing knob on most ohmmeters, and a selector switch for selecting the type of frequency you want to send down the cable. To the right is the buried frequency, which is 990 hertz, and to the left is 150 hertz used for aerial cable. Let's now get in on the receiver and see how that ties in with the transmitter. Looking at the right hand side, you'll notice we have a meter. This meter has two scales. The top scale is 0 to 100, and the bottom scale is 0 to 30. Normally, you'll only be using the top scale, and all the references in the operating manual refer to figures on that top scale. To the left, behind the grill, is a speaker, which is used for audibly bringing to us the sound of the transmitter signal. I'll give you an idea of what this sounds like by turning on the transmitter and listening to the receiver. You'll notice that it pulses at roughly seven pulses per second. Now before we go any further with the receiver, I'd like to point out two key features of any amplifier 
on an illustration that we have on the board. The lower, the lower figure will take a noise and signal into an amplifier, and all we really want is the signal to come out the other end. This is what a good filter will do for you. Directly above that, we have another drawing which shows just a signal, which is quite weak, going into an amplifier and coming out at a much higher level. Again, this is important to have in any amplifier. If we move now and take a look at the receiver, I'll point out the knobs that accomplish these two features. On the side of the instrument, we have two knobs. The bottom one is the fine gain control and the on-off switch. Pulling it turns the receiver on. The coarse gain switch has nine adjustments, approximately 10 dB steps at a time. On the bottom, we have four attachments to put into the receiver. First of all, on your far right, we have the buried or 990 hertz input. Next to that, we have the aerial or 150 hertz input. We have a jack for attaching a headset in unusually noisy locations. Any 600 ohm standard headset will work. And on the far left, we have a battery test button, which is used to check the quality of the batteries in the receiver. It would probably be a good idea now if we find out how to check the batteries and replace them when required. Using the receiver, you'll notice that we have a compartment on the right-hand side, which I'm going to open, to show you the two batteries that are used in the instrument. These are 8.4 volt E126 standard mercury cell batteries. Now moving up to the transmitter, the transmitter compartment can be opened with a quarter turn of a screwdriver. And inside, you'll see two 6-volt batteries. These are the banana plug batteries, which are normally available in an average hardware store. Anytime you have to replace these, because of the battery check features on both the receiver and transmitter, it only takes a matter of minutes. It's about time we ought to get into our operating manual now, so let's turn to pages 2.2 and 2-4 for further discussion on the controls. All tone sets use magnetic field principles. In the illustration, we have a metal conductor. This could be a piece of wire. It could be a cable or a pipe. And any time we place an electrical current from a battery source on this wire or pipe, we will set up magnetic lines of force. I'm sure each one of you has encountered situations where you have had induced AC on an aerial cable. This is strictly the result of the 60 hertz magnetic field that's set up by the power cable inducing a signal into your cable. When we place our tone on a buried or aerial cable, we're going to do the same thing with 990 hertz. This field, which we establish, collapses at the rate of 990 hertz per second. Moving over to the right-hand side now, we'd like to see how these magnetic fields are used in detecting the path and depth of cable. If you'll notice, we're now looking at an end view of the cable. In the lines of force, we have placed a coil of wires. This coil of wires will be induced by the magnetic field, and we will set up a voltage flow across that coil of wires. Depending on how much of the wire is in the magnetic field, we'll pretty well determine how much signal we will induce into that coil of wires. If you'll compare the right hand to the left hand figure, you'll see that the coils of wire in the right hand coil are being intersected by the magnetic lines of force. This will give us a maximum signal. In the left-hand picture, you'll notice that the coils of wire are not directly across the lines of force. And as a result, we have less signal. We're going to be using this principle a great deal in our tone fault locating techniques. 
but before we get into that, let's take a hard look at the seven cardinal rules of fault locating in your operating manual on page 4-1. Let's set up a situation now for locating the path of a buried cable. Imagine that you have a buried pick cable between two pedestals that you want to locate for a contractor or for your own use. First thing you're going to do is get the 4904A transmitter out and hook it up in this manner. If you look at the illustration, we're going to take the short black clip of the transmitter lead and hook it to the ground rod with the instrument. The long black lead has both a red and black clip at the end, and we're going to take the black clip and hook it to the cable so it's out of the way. We're going to attach the red clip lead to the sheath of the cable we want to locate. In this illustration, we have attached the red clip to the sheath of the cable. It's important that we do not use the short black lead because it is the same wire as the lead we have attached to the ground rod and we only want one return path for our electrical signal. We also want to place our transmitter 15 to 25 feet away from the path of the cable. This will enable us to get a nice clean magnetic field around the cable that is not disturbed by the voltage returning through the earth to the ground rod. The cable we're going to locate should be grounded at the far end. Normally your pedestal sheaths are bonded together at each pedestal. We'll turn our transmitter on, turning the signal loading switch to position one. This will send signal down the cable and set up our magnetic field. Normally for locating the path of a cable, position one is adequate. Now moving over to another illustration, we'll set our reference. Looking at the end of this cable we're going to locate, we have taken our quick search wand or rather our handheld wand, and we are standing on the cable path. By pointing the wand at the approximate location of the cable, we should have minimum signal in our receiver. By moving the wand at an angle 18 inches or so to the side, we should receive maximum signal. It's extremely important here to set a reference of 60 points on the logging meter of your receiver. Excessive signal at this point can cause real problems when we get into fault locating. Having established your path locating reference of 60 and a zero over the cable and 60 on the other side, you're now ready to walk this path. We simply walk along the cable moving the wand slowly back and forth to detect the null and mark that spot on the earth so we'll have the path traced between two points. Knowing the location of the cable is only half the problem. We now should be sure we know the depth of the cable. This can be done using the same handheld wand and the principles of magnetic fields. Remember, if we place the wand directly over the cable, we should have a minimum or null signal. Now by moving 90 degrees off the cable path and holding our wand at approximately a 45 degree angle, you'll suddenly notice we pick up a lot of signal again. But as you move away from the cable, you should encounter a second null. It's important to go beyond this null to see if the signal will in fact come back up, which it will normally do. Now work this approximate area to be sure you have located the sharpest null and mark the ground. The distance between that mark and the mark over the cable is equal to the distance between the cable and the top of the ground. It's time now to take a look at a movie and see some of these principles being applied. See if you can pick out each one. Our job on this particular case is to trace the path of this typical buried cable between two pedestals. We're using a separate ground rod and apparently we've been to this position before because we've already loosened the pedestal lid and you'll notice the craftsman here is 
going to find the shield has been isolated, and that was, as you recall, one of the very first things we want to do when we want to trace the path of a cable, isolate the sheath at the near end. For our preliminary analysis, we're going to be using the accessories with the 4904A fault locator. We'll need the amplifier or the receiver. We're going to need the test cords, which are stored in the lid of the test set. We have the 25-foot transmitter cord. This transmitter cord, as you recall, has a transmitter plug and short black lead used for sh tracing the path of the cable and a red and black lead on the other end, which will attach to the shield. In order to pick up the magnetic field, we're going to have to use some sort of coil. In this case, we'll use the three-section collapsible coil found with the instrument. It can be easily assembled by plugging one piece into the next. The six-foot coil cord will be used to connect the handheld wand and the receiver. We want to be sure that we select the proper input on the bottom of the receiver, in this case the 990 hertz plug. We will be using the 990 hertz tone in the transmitter for tracing the path of this cable. It's important that we be sure we have shield continuity and a shield ground at the far pedestal. So we want to plug the transmitter cord in and use the ground rod for completing our electrical circuit from the shield to the earth. So that we don't make a mistake and use the wrong black clip, we want to take the short clip with the red clip and hook it on the cable so it's out of the way. In preliminary analysis, you remember when using an ohmmeter, it's always important to zero this ohmmeter if you're going to have accurate readings. One technique for doing this is to short the red and black clips together And using the ohmmeter in the test set to do our analysis, we'll only have to make the hookup to the cable once. The signal loading switch can be used to first check the batteries, and the needle you'll notice swings to the right into the battery OK area. We can then move the signal loading switch to the ohms times one position and read resistances of zero to 1,000 ohms. With the clips shorted together, the ohms adjust knob can zero the ohmmeter out to a solid short or zero ohms. We're now ready to make our analysis of the sheath continuity between pedestals. You'll notice we've again clipped the short black lead back on the cable so it's out of the way. Taking the red clip and attaching to the isolated shield, it's important that we do not let the clip touch any part of the pedestal. This would give us a false ground at the near pedestal. Using the ohms reverse key, we're able to check for foreign battery on the shield of the cable. Normally, this is indicated by a deflection in the needle 
on the ohmmeter. Remember one of the basic rules of setting up the transmitter properly for the path of a cable is to move the transmitter 15 to 25 feet at 90 degrees to the general path of the cable. We do this so that our signal will travel down the cable and return to the ground rod away from the cable path. Our magnetic field can most easily be detected using this technique. Turning the signal loading switch to position one or two and getting a blinking light is the first step in sending out our signal. Now with the receiver and wand, we want to set our reference. You'll notice that the receiver has two knobs on the side, the on-off fine control and the coarse gain attenuator. Over the cable path, you'll notice that we have plenty of signal as indicated by the meter in the upper left-hand corner. In fact, it's over near 90 or above. One of your cardinal rules was to have minimum transmitter output with near maximum gain. And when you have excessive signal over the cable, you should turn the transmitter down as he has done in the picture. Now checking our reference once again, we adjust the receiver to get a maximum signal of no more than 60 points on either side of the cable. Marking the location of the cable, we want to do one other thing before tracing it, and that's get the depth. Remember, we get off 90 degrees to the path of the cable and back away with the wand at a 45 degree angle. We look for the second null, and upon locating it, mark the ground. The distance between the cable location mark and our depth mark gives us the approximate depth of the cable. Now we're ready to trace the path. This ought to be duck soup for you fellows. You now have all the principles down for tracing the path of a cable, but there are a couple of things you ought to look out for. For example, what about a paralleling water pipe or a pipe that crosses under your cable? Or what about the loops that go into pedestals? Well, some of these things, as well as the one that's illustrated on this tape, can be discussed by your instructor. But let's look at this buried loop that was placed by construction. You'll notice that the figures, which indicate the reference in your receiver, start out with 60 points on either side, just as we were told in the basic guidelines. But on the side of the cable where you have a loop, the magnetic fields add to each other, and you'll get an increase in signal. Should you be tracing a path for a contractor who's going to parallel your cable, on one side, it'd be very advantageous to listen and look at your signal on that side of the cable very carefully for just this kind of an indication. It could be a buried loop. Now, before we go out and actually perform this task, let's take a look at a little test to see how many of the principles we can remember. You'll notice in the drawing, we have a simulated cable. I must admit, this is a little unusual because of the way it was buried, but it's a good chance for us to review what happens to magnetic fields. We started out with a cable three feet deep, and we set our reference. And you remember what the reference was? 60 points. What do you think is going to happen when that cable comes up to within six inches of the ground? Well, if you said your signal is going to increase, you're correct, but because remember, the magnetic field is stronger the closer you are to the cable. Going further, the plow went down to five feet deep. And here, your magnetic field and signal are going to decrease. But what about over here, where we've gone up to one foot in depth, and we added a steel plate? What did we say about a metal pipe or a steel plate being an adjacent position to our cable? It absorbs part of the magnetic field, doesn't it? And therefore, our signal would be less at this location. All right, now you're going to go out and actually do this on a real live cable. 
And then we're going to come back in and get into a detailed discussion of fault analysis charts and typical buried pick cable troubles. From your discussion, you found out that sheathed earth faults in a buried pick cable are the easiest to find with a tone set. Remember that most buried cable troubles are caused by some sort of external damage, and this is why we normally have sheath grounds to work, for, work on. If you look at this illustration, you'll see that we have gone one step beyond the techniques used to trace the path and depth. We have isolated the far end shield. What this does for us is it presents an electrical path for our cable signal to go down the sheath and to the faulted area and earth in returning to us, of course, to our ground rod. So your hookup, your reference setting with the receiver and the transmitter are identical to tracing the path of depth, a path and depth of cable. And remember, the signal we want is 60 points on either side of the cable. We want the transmitter 90 degrees to the path of the cable and 15 to 25 feet away. We only want to use the red clip at the pedestal attached to the shield. When our signal travels down this cable, we set up our magnetic field. This magnetic field is going to reduce in strength at the fault. And the reason for it, of course, is that your voltage is traveling down to the fault and then into the earth and returning to the test set. It is this drop in magnetic field that you're going to look for as you walk the path of that cable. Normally this drop will cover a distance of four to six feet. From 60 points you may drop to 20 points in that four to six feet. This is your first clue that you may be in the area of a sheath ground. If this sheath ground and cable are in private right away or where you have grass or ground cover, it's now advantageous to use an accessory which we have not talked about until this time. It's that aluminum shaped A-frame or contact frame. If we'll look at this other illustration, we'll talk a little bit about the principle used with the contact frame. You'll notice that we're now looking at the top of a cable from above the ground and you'll notice our cable path runs in this case under a driveway. Well, for the time being bear with me and don't pay much attention to the fact that the driveway is over the cable. What I want to talk about are these circles. The contact frame operates on the principle of voltage gradients. This simply means that the voltage you are sending down the cable enters the earth at the fault. It sets up rings of voltage, much like you would do if you dropped a rock in a puddle of water. These rings of voltage radiate around the place where you dropped the rock. They get weaker as you move further away. And all our contact frame does is detects the relative voltage levels on two different rings when you place the contact frame in the ground. Let's look at another illustration to be sure we use the contact frame properly. We should have attached the contact frame to the receiver using the six foot coil cord and place the contact frame directly in the ground over the cable path. Do not, as is shown in the right hand picture, straddle the cable with the contact frame. This will give you an erroneous reading. It's also significant that you place both points of the contact frame into the ground solid, solidly and firmly. If you don't, you will not get a good comparison of the voltage at those two points. Let's move over now to another illustration and see how we would now use the contact frame. This is the same fault we were working on before and we had located the general area of the sheath ground using the wand. To use the contact frame, we move back approximately 20 feet toward the transmitter end of the cable. We must now establish a new reference for the contact frame. 
This is very important that you set the reference properly so we can get the right indication over the fault. We want a low level signal in the receiver using the contact frame. Now this is just the opposite of the 60 point reference we used with the wand. But the low level should be five or 10 points. We obtain this by placing the contact frame firmly in the ground and adjusting the receiver. Having done this, we now move the contact frame two or three feet at a time in the direction of the suspected fault area. You should notice an appreciable increase in your signal as you approach the fault. The meter will indicate this as you get closer and closer. In fact, on a sheath to earth fault, you will generally get more signal than is required prior to the fault and you'll have to adjust the receiver downward. Because remember, we did say you do not want more than 60 or 70 points in the receiver at any one time. If it goes over 60 or 70, turn the receiver down. And then continue to move forward with the contact frame, moving fewer and fewer inches at a time, the greater the increase in signal becomes. The, until you reach a point where you will have, on this dotted frame, one point, the leading edge, directly over the fault that will give you the strongest signal you're going to receive. Moving the frame another 12 inches and directly straddling the fault as you see illustrated in the middle frame, you will have no signal. Immediately moving past, again your signal will peak up. So this is the kind of a signal you want to look for, a gradual increase to a peak, a sharp null, directly over the cable and directly over the fault, and then an immediate peak on the other side and a gradual drop off as you move away. Now there are several special situations on sheath grounds which you're going to be discussing in some depth with the instructor and you're also going to experience on real live sheath grounds. Let's now go ahead and look at a movie of a typical situation finding a sheath to earth fault. This man has just passed a suspected area of a sheath ground. He now turns around and holds the wand stationary to one side and walks back toward the faulted area, looking for an increase in signal. Where the signal starts up, he's going to mark the ground. Now he will continue on and look for further increases in signal to where he reaches his original 60 point reference level. Again, he carefully looks for 60 points and marks the ground. Now he will look between these two marks halfway and that should be the area of the fault. Remember this would be a four to six foot section. He can pinpoint this fault now with the contact frame. Removing the wand and inserting the cord in the contact frame, he's now ready to set a new reference. This new reference is going to be a low reference approximately five or ten points on the meter. He does this directly over the cable with the contact frame firmly placed in the ground. Then he proceeds to move the frame a foot or two at a time toward the suspected area, all the while getting an increase in signal. The signal will increase sufficiently in many times, so he'll have to adjust the receiver again. And he continues forward placing the frame in the ground, comparing the voltage. As he gets very near the fault, he will encounter a sharp drop in signal. This drop will be from 60 points maximum to a very sharp null or no signal. He marks the ground in the middle of the frame Placing one point on his mark on either side of the fault, he will again get 60 points. To verify this location, it's good to go 90 degrees to the side and approach the faulted area. The signal will increase until the leading edge is directly over the fault. It will know when he exactly straddles the fault. A good check to use 
when you've located a suspected sheath ground is to look for the null all the way around in a circle. That ring of voltage is equal on both sides of that fault and therefore no signal. Placing one point of the frame on the fault, we can now make another circle, but this time receiving 60 points maximum. This 60 point should be fairly stable over the whole circle. Here's a special case of a cable that's been buried under a blacktop road and you're not going to be able to use the contact frame on top of the road surface. This is a lead-in for a, an exercise that your instructor has prepared. Let's get to work. In an earlier lesson, you discussed the different types of faults that can be found in a typical buried cable. You've just had experience with the easiest type of fault to find, and that was a shield to earth fault. Now we're going to take a look at the second most easy to find fault, and that is a conductor to shield ground. A couple of words of caution are in order here. One, when you're doing your preliminary analysis on conductor to shield grounds, you want to be sure that you in fact have that type of fault and not a cross to a working tip. Because remember, a working tip goes back to the central office ground. So you could actually have a cross and not a conductor to shield fault. The other thing that's particularly significant about these faults, and we will discuss this in a special case, is the kind of signal you're going to get from the magnetic field. What you see in front of you is a typical hookup and setup on a conductor to shield ground. We have isolated the conductor and the shield at the far end. We have hooked our transmitter up now somewhat differently. You'll notice we're using the red and black clips at the end of the 25-foot transmitter cord. The short black lead, which we used for sheath grounds to a ground rod, is now not being used for this kind of fault. In fact, we should place this in the receiver storage compartment of the transmitter so it doesn't get in the way. Our reference setting, transmitter output, and receiver settings are all done the same way you would do them for a sheath to earth or tracing the path of a cable. We want only 60 points of signal on either side of the cable with the receiver. Having set your reference, you can now proceed to walk this cable and you will look for a drop in the signal. Now that's the same kind of signal indication with the wand that you're going to look for and have looked for on a shield to earth fault. Past the conductor to shield fault, we have little or no signal. The wand will give you the general area of the fault and normally you cannot use the contact frame for this type of fault. The only time you use the contact frame is on a shield to earth ground. Now earlier I mentioned we're going to take a look at a special case and I'd like to refer to that other illustration now where we have again a conductor to shield ground but we've made one change. We've placed either a splice case or a repair sleeve or another shield ground beyond the fault. This cannot always be determined in your analysis, so you should at least be aware of this situation if your signal does some strange things in a suspected area. If, for example, your signal goes from 60 points to 90, that tells you that you have this kind of a situation and you should come back and set a low reference of 25 points in the receiver between the transmitter and the suspected fault area. Then as you approach the fault area, the signal will in fact increase at the fault. And the reason for this is that your magnetic field that you're setting up around the shield of the cable and the conductor are canceling each other up to the fault. But beyond the fault, the tone is traveling on the shield alone to the earth. And that accounts for the increase in the magnetic strength you have beyond the fault. 
Your instructor has some conductor to shield faults in the buried cable outside and you'll have a chance to try both of these principles. And then we'll come back in for a look at conductor faults. The two easiest faults, sheathed to earth grounds and conductor to shield grounds, are now behind you. We're up to the tough ones now, the crosses and shorts in buried pick cable. If we look at a twisted pair of wires in a telephone cable, I'd like to ask you why they do this. You may say that, well, that's to cut down crosstalk, and you're right. If we examine what you're going to do with a tone on a cross or a short, you'll see a very interesting parallel. A cross, by definition, is a fault between two conductors of two different pairs. When we try and send a tone down these two wires, which are twisted in the wrap of the cable, we're going to get canceling magnetic fields. It's even more significant on a short, which is a fault between the tip and ring of one pair. Here we get almost complete cancellation of magnetic fields. And therein lies the reason why buried crosses and buried short faults are extremely difficult to locate above the ground. However, with the 4904A, you do have the potential to locate certain types of faults. And at the end of this exercise, you can refer to the fault analysis chart to examine the limits of the 4904A. Looking at illustration 4-8 in your operating manual, which is the one we've chosen for this tape, you'll notice our hookup includes the red and black leads attached to the faulted conductors. These faulted conductors have been isolated at the far end. The short black lead by the transmitter is again kept out of the way, stored in the receiver compartment of the transmitter. The signal on a cross or a short is different than the signal for tracing the path of the cable. Remember tracing the path of the cable, we had a signal on both sides of the cable and nothing over the cable. Well, a cross or a short is just the opposite. We have signal over the cable on a cross or short. It is with this signal that we set our reference of 60 points. You're going to have to get the 60 point reference by moving your wand vertically along the path of the cable for a section of maybe four or five feet. Just like you do when you run aerial faults, you have to slide the coil along the cable because the signal will go up and down. You want to find the highest signal to set the 60 point reference. Having done this, you now simply walk the path of the cable which you have previously located and listen for last peak. This last peak is where you'll find the cross. Beyond that fault, you'll have little or no signal. If we look at a short as compared to a cross, you're going to find that the cross gives you more signal above the ground. In fact, on a short, you'll be lucky to get any signal above the ground until you get to the spot of the fault itself. And here you may get a small amount of signal. Once again, we have some movie footage for you to show you the technique for setting the reference, and then you're going to have a work exercise on the cable plant. Here we've isolated the faulty conductors and are in the process of connecting the red and black clip leads to these faulty conductors. We want to be sure that the conductor leads don't touch the pedestal for a false ground. And we want to store that short black lead in the receiver compartment of the test set. We've completed our preliminary analysis and we've set our signal level to a blinking light. Remember the signal now will be over the cable not on either side, so we hold the wand vertical directly over the cable path, which we previously located. We move it back and forth to find the peak signal and then simply proceed to walk the path of that cable looking for the last peak signal.
Up until now, we've been concentrating our time and efforts on buried trouble and high resistant faults in buried pick cable. Well, what about aerial? Let's take a look at some of the techniques and problems involved in finding high resistance conductor faults in aerial cable. First of all, we're not going to use the 990 hertz signal out of the transmitter, but rather we're going to use the aerial frequency, which is 150. The reason we're going to use 150 hertz is because we don't want to noise up adjacent pairs and we don't want the signal to carry by the high resistance fault. And the importance of carry by signal can't be overstressed. And the chart you see in front of you illustrates how this works. There's a direct relationship between the resistance of the fault and the length of cable we can have beyond the fault. And that's a key word. I'm not going to go into it in great depth now, but your instructor will have several exercises when we finish this portion of the tape on how to apply this type of chart. But you must be able to relate resistance to wire beyond the fault to be effective in finding high resistance conductor faults. Now let's move over to another illustration and actually examine the technique we use. We're going to hook the transmitter up to the faulted conductors which have been isolated just like we would on a buried cable. We're going to now use a different exploring coil, either the Western Electric 105 or some equivalent, which will plug directly into the 4994 receiver at the 150 hertz input. We'll place this coil against the cable and set a reference of 60 points. Now remember a couple of points about reference setting. In twisted wires, we have signal that will go up and down as you move the coil along the cable. You want to be sure that you have the peak signal, where those wires are closest to your coil. And if that peak signal is greater than 60, what are you going to do? Well, you're going to go back and turn that transmitter down, because that's one of the cardinal rules of fault locating. Minimum transmitter, near maximum receiver gain. Having done this, you now simply move along the cable path, and you will look for a place where that tone drops in signal because our signal, you recall, goes down the conductor to the fault and then back. There should be little carry-by if you've set the transmitter and the receiver properly and applied the earlier chart we talked about. This will work for crosses and shorts in aerial cable. Now let's take a look at a movie illustrating these techniques that we've just discussed. first thing we're going to want to do is analyze the fault as we've always done on cable trouble. We're going to select the aerial 150 hertz switch on the transmitter and send signal down the cable on the faulty conductors. We now will use an aerial coil such as the Western Electric 105 and plug it into the 150 hertz input of the receiver. We'll set our reference by placing the coil against the side of the cable and moving it along to look for that peak signal and adjusting the transmitter and receiver for 60 points. Once we've set the reference at 60 and we're sure we have the peak signal, we can move on. Being careful we don't raise the coil above or below the cable because this will greatly distort the signal you receive. Splits are special cases of aerial trouble. In this illustration, we see we have a split between two pairs within a cable. We've identified these pairs by our analysis, and we have placed a strap on these two wires at the far end. These are the split conductors, you, as you can see if you trace this wire back to the transmitter source. We can hook up the tone set, the 4904A, to the split conductors. And sending a signal down these conductors, we will notice a change in that signal at the split location. Specifically, if you analyze this, you'll see you're really running a fault, which in this case is two wires of two different pair, 
or by our definition that's a cross. Beyond the fault or the split we're running a short. And you know from our experience that you'll have more signal in this area than you will beyond the fault. And that's what you're going to look for. You're going to look for 60 points up to the split and a low level signal beyond the split. Now let's move to a different illustration which I'm sure you'll recognize having worked with this during the course. It's complex, it's hard to read, it's a lot like fault locating. Fault locating is not a science but it's an art and the instruments and the equipment you're going to use are only as good as the man behind it. Hopefully you gain something from the course and you will be a more effective troubleshooter from here on. Happy fault locating.